Pie Catcher. A series of true stories of the unceasing search for enemy spies in water. Based on the memoirs of Lieutenant Colonel Oreste Pinto of the Allied Counterintelligence Service. This week's story is entitled Margin of Error. The part of Colonel Pinto is played by Bernard Archer. In the long years of war, the peoples of occupied Europe were being more and more oppressed by the Germans and the flow of escapers from Europe became fairly regular, almost predictable. There were two main escape routes, the short route by boat across the North Sea, and the long overland route running from Denmark through Holland, Belgium, France, and Spain to Lisbon. Usually the escapers arrived in England in twos and threes, sometimes in a party of a dozen or more. But one autumn, I had to face a very different problem. Come in. Uh, what is it, Captain? A report, sir. A liner from Canada. It's due in Glasgow tomorrow. 800 escapers and refugees on board. How many? 800, sir. All nationalities. Uh, here's the list, sir. French, Belgian, Dutch, Danish, Czech, Pole, Spaniard? Spanish communist, sir. Mm. They escaped into France after the Civil War. Now they're escaping from the Germans. Have you checked this list? Oh, yes, sir. Now, this 800 was shipped in groups from Lisbon to the West Indies and then to Canada. Now they pushed them all back to join the free forces. Oh, well, see. Well, the army can't provide an escort to bring them all to London, so they want us to send a team to Glasgow to screen them on board. All right. Get together a team covering these languages. Oh, um, seven men should do. And book sleepers to Glasgow. We'll go tonight. Yes, sir. Uh, and have this passenger list broken down into nationalities, and we'll plan our work on the night train. Yes, this is your compartment, sir. Oh. Ah, quite a crowd, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. Looks as if half the British Army's on the train. <laughs> uh, shall I put your bag on the rack, sir? Uh, thank you. Uh, Captain, yes, sir? when we go aboard the liner tomorrow morning, I want you to take over the main dining room, turn it into an examination room. And I want the baggage and personal belongings of every passenger carefully examined. Yes, sir. And this is a list of collaborators, uh, and suspect collaborators, compiled by the free government. We'll have this list checked against the passenger list and have all suspects weeded out for special interrogation. Colonel? Yes, sir, Paul? I sorted out the Belgian contingent, sir. Oh, good. Uh, here's the Belgian suspect list. Would you cross-check it with your list? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Captain, here are the Polish and Czech suspect lists. You might pass them on. Yes. Uh, will you take the French? I'll deal with the Dutch. Thank you, sir. What time do we arrive in Glasgow? Uh, seven in the morning, sir. Will you manage some sleep, sir? <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> well, good night, sir. Good night. We boarded the liner and set up our examination room and our interview room. We weeded out seven known collaborators and sent them to London under escort. Then the real work began, the steady examination of the other escapers. Leopold, my Belgian lieutenant, made the first strike. Colonel? Yes? I think I found one, sir. Who? Hmm? A spy, a Belgian, sir. Give the name of uh, Farah. Jules Varat. His age? 45, sir. So what's his story? I said he was born in Courtrai and was a waiter in an hotel in Antwerp. Which hotel? Hotel Excelsior. Go on. Says the Germans requisitioned the hotel and he lost his job. He returned to Courtrai and joined the resistance. The Germans raided their meeting place, but he got away. So he had to come out of Europe. When was this? Last year, sir. He left Belgium and escaped to Lisbon. And here he is, backed by a Canada. Well, it's not an unusual story. What makes you suspect him? Well, first, he, he strikes me as being a well-educated man, sir. I think too well-educated for a waiter, even in Antwerp. And then the money. Sir? Uh, what money? Well, this money, sir. It's mostly Canadian money. Also, 150 pounds in English five-pound notes and 300 American dollars. Hmm. How does he account for it? Oh, the usual story, sir. His life savings, 
But you don't believe him? No, sir. Any other points of suspicion? His manner, sir. I'd expect a waiter trained in such a good hotel to speak quietly, to move quietly, to be very respectful. Was anyone in the Belgian contingent who knew him in Antwerp or in Courtrai? I haven't found one yet, sir. Anything else you've noticed about his baggage or property? No, sir, not a thing. All right, let me have a list of his belongings and bring him to me. Name, please. Barat, sir. Jules Barat. Nationality? Belgium. Age? Forty-five. Are you married? No, sir. Where are you born? Coutre. Your parents alive? My father is alive. My mother is dead. Where is your father? Coutre. His name? Anton. Nationality of both parents? Belgium, sir. I'm of Flemish blood. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and all the way back. Religion? Catholic, sir. Trade or profession? Waiter, sir. Uh, where? Restaurant, cafe, hotel? Hotel, sir, in Antwerp, the Hotel Excelsior. How long were you there? Since I was 19, sir. All my time, I was trained there. And why did you leave? The war, sir. When the Germans came, the hotel was requisitioned for the headquarters. There was no need for waiters, and we were dismissed. Mm-hmm. What kind of headquarters? I, I don't know, sir. We, we weren't told. For the Abwehr, I believe. And what did you do? I tried to find a job in Antwerp, but it was no use. Everything was so unsettled. So after time, I returned to Courtrai. To look for a job? Yes, sir. That was even worse. As you will know, sir, Courtrai is not far from the French border, and well, the Germans were requisitioning everything. Food was rationed, and there was no work for me. Well, what did you do? There was nothing to do. So I had nothing more to lose. I joined the resistance. In Courtrai? Yes, sir. Uh, which group? Uh, who was your leader? It was a small group, sir. Seven of us. We made propaganda against the Germans. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, one of our members had a small printing press, and well, we'd meet there to print handbills and slogans that would annoy the Germans and let the people know that the resistance had started. At night after curfew, we would post them in public places so that they would be seen by the people in the morning. In the town square, bus stops, on church doors for people going to early mass, on notice boards and places like that also where they'd annoy the Germans most, the doors of German billets, on top of the German public notices, and sometimes at their headquarters. Now, what was the main purpose of this, to annoy the Germans or to encourage the resistance? <laughs> Both, sir. Mainly to encourage the people so that they wouldn't lose heart. And the Germans tore these notices down? Yes, always, but not before they'd been seen. And were your group responsible for the whole town in this way? Yes, sir. With only seven people to compile, print, and distribute them? Well, Coutre is not a small town. You had helpers, about 12 of them. Hmm. Oh, you were annoying the Germans. What action did they take? Well, we had to meet always at the same place. The printing press couldn't be moved. One evening when I was going there, I saw two cars pulled up outside the shop. I stayed in the shadows and went closer. They were Gestapo cars. There was a guard on the door. I stayed in the shadows and slipped away. I went back to my lodging. And then I remembered that this was dangerous. If my friends were caught, they might get my name and my address. My lodgings was not a sanctuary. It was a trap. I went out immediately. Then I realized that it was near to curfew time and it was dangerous to be on the streets with nowhere to go. Where did you go? I'm a Catholic, sir. A good Catholic. I went immediately to the priory outside Courtrai and I gave myself up to the prior. I told him what had happened and I asked his advice. And what did he advise? He asked me many searching questions, as you are doing, sir. <laughs> and the, he made no comment or promise, but he kept me inside the priory all that night. Next day, he must have heard about the raids and the arrests. He sent for me and said that I could stay until the search had died down, and he gave me a place to sleep. How long did you stay there? For a month. And the prior sent for me again. He said that four of the brothers were going on a visit to a priory in France. He gave me the robes and the sandals of the order and so that I should go with them. I was also given food for the journey. Where was this next priory? At uh, Epernay, sir. I stayed there for two weeks, and again it was arranged that some of the brothers should visit a priory further south, at uh, Bourges, and I was sent with them. And in the same way, south again to Montauban, and finally to the Spanish border. It was an escape route run by the brothers. Oh, did you meet any other escapers at the priory? No, sir. And when you reached the Spanish frontier? The brothers found a guide and 
I was allowed to join a group escaping into Spain. Hmm. How many in this group? Uh, six. Their names, Dean. Well, we gave no names. With the others, I was a brother in holy orders making a journey to Spain, and I asked no questions. And when you reached Spain? I made for Portugal. Then to Lisbon, and I reported to the Belgian consul. I was questioned again, and my name was put on a list of others waiting to sail to freedom. In a week, I was put on a ship to the West Indies, then to the United States, then to Canada, where we were put into a camp. Then all refugees who were prepared to serve their governments in England were put on this liner and sent to Britain. Hmm. How long did all this take? Since the Gestapo, right? Yes. Oh, more than a year. Fourteen months. You volunteered to return from Canada? <laughs> there was very little choice. Some were kept, some were returned. They said that a free Belgian government had been set up in London and our place was here. Yes. Now, you say that all your working life you were a waiter. Yes, sir. And that this money is yours. Yes, sir. How did you get it? By saving, sir. Well, it's a lot of money for a waiter to save, even in a big hotel. I saved it all, sir. I was hoping to return to Courtrai and open a little restaurant. I, I had more money than that. I have I've been keeping myself for a year. Well, how do you account for your savings being in Canadian money, English money, and American dollars? Well, I was in the United States, and I changed some into American money. I, I think with $300 left. When I was in Canada, I changed the rest of it to Canadian dollars, but when I knew I was coming here, I changed some to English money. 150 pounds. Yes, your calculations are correct, Mr. Verard. But it's my duty to tell you now that I don't believe your story. Why not? For many reasons. Let's take just one of them. You say you're a Fleming, that your parents, grandparents, and all the way back were Flemish. Yes. That you worked all your life in Antwerp, which is a Flemish city, but... I'm not sure that you are Flemish. I am Flemish. No. You're no more Flemish than I am. You say you worked as a waiter? Yes. In the Hotel Excelsior? Yes. In which part of the hotel? The dining room. Well, I know this hotel. Tell me, when you enter the dining room, on which side are the doors to the kitchen? On, on the right. When you enter the kitchen, where does the chef stand? On the left. What was the name of the head waiter? <laughs> which one? Over these years, we had four. The last one, when the Germans came. He was a Frenchman. Uh, he was not. You ask me questions, I give you the answers. You disagree. Why? I'm Flemish, you say that I'm not. I'm a waiter, you say that I'm not. Where does this lead us? You'll know soon enough. Now this money you're carrying. It's a very large sum of money. And it's in several convenient currencies. Con convenient? For what? That's what I want you to tell me. I've told you my story. And I've told you quite clearly that I don't believe it. I'm a very busy man, Bellas. I have several hundred people to clear and get off the ship. I have no more time to waste on you at the moment. Will you come in, please? Now, will you save my time and your own and tell me the truth now? I've told you the truth. Very well. Yes, sir? Put Bellas under guard. Have him sent to London. We'll deal with him there. Yes, sir. Good way, please. Verath had told his story very well, but there were several points that puzzled me. I didn't believe that he had been a waiter, or that is, in a superior hotel like the Excelsior. I gave him a test. A table was laid, as though a meal had just been finished. He'd said he was a trained waiter, so I told him to remove the debris quickly and efficiently. He did this quite adequately, but didn't convince me he'd been doing it all his life. Also, I didn't believe he was a Fleming. If he was a Fleming, then Flemish would be his mother tongue, and French would be his second language. If he was, as I believe, the Walloon, then it would be the other way around. In London, I arranged for Leopold, who was a Fleming, and who also knew Antwerp and Courtrai well, to interrogate him thoroughly in both languages. Well, I questioned him for three hours, sir, in Flemish and in French. I'm certain he's no Fleming. I've also questioned him on the district where he says he lives, in Courtrai and in Antwerp. Yes? Well, it's difficult to put a finger on it, sir. He knows the towns well enough, but I'm sure he never lived there. He doesn't have an intimate knowledge of the district. How certain are you of this? Oh, I'd swear to it, sir. Would you go into a witness box and swear on oath that he's not a Fleming? 
Yes, sir. Oh, well, you may have to. I have a report from the Belgian authorities, and the Courtray resistance has no knowledge of him. He's very stubborn, sir. Well, I can be stubborn, too. But unless we are very careful, your fish may slip off the hook. Lack of evidence, sir? Yes. I don't believe he was a waiter. You don't believe he's a Fleming. We can't prove it. No. His story's been very carefully worked out. Waiter at an hotel, now requisitioned by the Germans, so we can't check with the staff. In a resistance group where all the others were conveniently captured, and a prior to speak for him. And the money is his life savings to buy a cafe. It doesn't convince me, but it could convince a jury. Mm. Um, one last try. Do you have any Flemish friends in London? Someone not on my staff, and preferably from Antwerp. Oh, I have a friend on leave in London at the moment, sir. He's staying with me. He's from Antwerp. He was in the resistance there. He's now in the merchant navy. Mm, that's excellent. Could you bring him here? Yes, sir. Well, this one is not in the book, Leopold. But I'll tell you what I want him to do. Bring him here tomorrow and let me know. I'll call Bell out for questioning... While I'm questioning him, you bring your friend into the outer office. By the way, what's his name? Francois. Sir. Francois. Well, I'll signal him by pressing this buzzer. Ah, oh, but Bellart mustn't see me. Um, well, we'd better get a switch rigged up under the desk. Oh, yes, sir. Then I want him to come straight in as though he was coming to see me. I want him to pretend to recognize Bellart and denounce him as a traitor. But, sir, this... it may work. Could he make a good job of that? Oh, yes, sir, but... I'll take full responsibility. Bring him here tomorrow, and we'll arrange a story. Yes, sir. I'll phone him now. Next day, I met Francois, prepared the story, arranged the signal, and sent for Berat again. Berat, sir. Good morning, Berat. Sit down, please. Sleep well? Yes. When we last met, I told you that I have to make a report on your case and that I'm determined that the facts in the report will be true. Will you now give me the true facts? I have given them. That you're a Fleming, that you were born in Courtrai, that you lived and worked most of your life in Antwerp, that you were a waiter at the Hotel Excelsior, and that this is the remains of your savings. That is correct. We've given you a fair examination, and we are satisfied that you're not a Fleming. Your knowledge of Courtrai is fair, but not good enough. I don't believe that you were born and brought up there. Your knowledge of Antwerp is fair, but I'm not convinced that you lived and worked there for more than 20 years. I'm convinced that you're not an experienced waiter of the type to be employed in the Hotel Excelsior, and I'm not satisfied that this money represents your life savings. I have told you the truth. I've made it clear to you, Bellard, and I'll make it clear again. I know you are not telling the truth. I want to know why. There's something you're concealing from me. I want to know what it is. I can have you detained for the duration of the war. And until I know who you are and why you have come here, you will not leave this headquarters. Is that clear? What do you want me to do? I've been checking with the Belgian authorities. They've been in touch with Courtrai. The resistance there have no knowledge of you. It was a small group. I told you the others were taken by the Gestapo. I was lucky. That is why I came away. When you first told me about the group, you said it was small, only seven. When I pointed out that seven couldn't do all the work that you described, you changed your story. You added twelve. They were helpers, only helpers. Distributing subversive leaflets, pinning them on German billets, on official German notice boards, in the town square. Only helpers. The penalty for this was the same for all. No, Bella. These people would be in the group. You changed the number to suit my questioning. First it was seven, then it was nineteen. But this is Give true. me the name of one person, here or in Belgium, who can prove your story is true. I'll get in touch with him. The prior. At the priory in Courtrai. You'd believe him, wouldn't you? Yes, but I already believe that part of your story of how you came out of Belgium. He doesn't know who you are. I want to know about you before you tried to reach England, before you arrived at the priory. What do you want me to do? Tell you my story all over again? Yes. And we'll begin with the Hotel Excelsior. When did you start work there? When I was 19. That was in 1916. Early in 1917. In the First World War? Yes. I started work in the kitchen, cleaning and carrying and scrubbing. Later in 1919, I began to train as a waiter. You wish to ask me more questions about the hotel? 
I've been a guest at the Excelsior. I have no doubt you have too. When I first questioned you about the hotel, I asked questions that I, as a guest, knew the answers to. Your answers were at the same time. If you had been a waiter, you'd know every 18 inch of the kitchens and the passages. I expected you to elaborate your answer in that way, but you didn't. It's very easy to sit there and disbelieve. What are you trying to do to me? Do you think that I'm some kind of German agent? Are you? No. You say that you were wanted by the Gestapo in Belgium. Yes, that is why I left Belgium. That is why I am here. Yes, I know there's a reason for your being here. You say you were in the resistance. Yes. Tell me about it. I've already told you. I was working in Antwerp at the Hotel Excelsior. When the Germans came, the hotel was requisitioned as a headquarters. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know you were engaged. No, all right, Papa. Come in. What is it? I wonder if you're finished with those reports. Am I? Do you know this man? Yes, sir. He's Jules Verras. I knew him in Antwerp. Is this true, Verras? Do you know this officer? It's, it's a lie. I, I never saw him in my life. No, you've never seen me. But I've seen you. It's, it's a lie. Quiet, Verras. At least he knows that you're Jules Verras. He says he was a waiter at the Excelsior. Did he ever work at the Excelsior? Yes, sir, but not as a waiter. When the Germans took over the hotel, it became the headquarters of the Abwehr. He worked for the Abwehr. What is this? Be quiet, sir. Go on. He's a collaborator, sir. He was a messenger for the Abwehr. We used to watch him running between the Abwehr and the spy school with messages. He was on our list, but we could never get him. One day, he just disappeared. How did he get out, sir? Well, he tricked one of the religious orders into believing he was a patriot. A patriot? <laughs> well, I'm glad you caught him, sir. Thank you, Papa. I'll, uh, I'll come back later, sir. Well, Verath, what have you to say now? Only this. I've never seen that man in my life. And he knows nothing about me. He's prepared to swear to it. Would you let him? Would you let him swear that I was a collaborator? That I worked for the Germans? Try me and see. You wouldn't dare. Why not? Because it's a trick. And you can prove nothing. Why are you so sure? Because my name is not Jules Verath. That's why. And I've not been in Antwerp since the Germans came. So your friend could not have seen me there. The story of the Abbey is a pack of lies and you're both in this together. I don't know what you're trying to do, but no matter how hard you try, you cannot prove me to be a traitor. Because I never was. If you're not there, who are you? My true name is Vernot. I'm a doctor of medicine. Dr. Andre Vernot of Brussels. Your address in Brussels? My home and my surgery were in the Place de Marseille. Can you prove it? Now that you know, you can check with the authorities. You can check with the resistance. The Brussels resistance will tell you that I am a patriot. And I am wanted by the Gestapo. I escaped from Brussels to Courtrai and went to the Priory there. The rest of the story is as I have told you. Why did the Gestapo want you? Ask the Brussels resistance. Well, at least we're getting the story right at last. You are not a Fleming. You admit now that you are not a waiter. And you were not born in Courtrai. I was born in Brussels. You are Dr. André Vernot at the Place de Martyr in Brussels. Yes. And I'll check this information, but it would save time if you told me why you were wanted by the Gestapo. Ask the Brussels resistance. I had a good practice in Brussels. That accounts for the money that I have. I say that I'm sorry that you've not caught a traitor. I still want to know why you lied to me. I have nothing more to say. The checking of Verat's story, or Vernot's story, took several days, almost a week. But at last, we had results. Well, we've had him identified, sir. He is Dr. André Vernot of Brussels. He had a surgery in the Place des Martyrs. He worked for the resistance in Brussels, and he is wanted by the Gestapo. Hmm. Uh, if he is a resistance worker, a patriot, then why did he lie to me? He is wanted by the Belgian police. It's there in the report, sir. Three years before the war, he was struck off the medical register for unprofessional conduct. He continued to practice, and as an unregistered doctor, he was wanted by the Belgian police. He wanted a fresh start, so he changed his name to Vera. Mm, he tried to, sir. Mm-hmm. 
we were wrong about him, weren't we? Yes, sir. But at least we have the true story. I had been completely wrong. But their note, or their last attempt to get a new start in life, succeeded. In war, many things are forgiven, and good doctors were in demand. He served for the rest of the war in the Belgian Medical Corps. And after the war, I had a letter from him, a forgiving letter, inviting me to spend a holiday with him. But somehow, I didn't accept. You've been listening to Spy Catcher with Bernard Archard as Colonel Areste Pinto. The script was written by Robert Barr and the program produced for the BBC by Charles Maxwell.